Welcome and aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we will go across the sea to Seattle to talk with Dan Harris, the founder of Harris Bricken, an international law firm with offices in Seattle and other U.S. cities, and also in foreign countries with cities like Barcelona and Beijing hosting their law firms. Dan and other lawyers in his firm share their extensive knowledge and experience on their website blogs. The firm's China Law blog is one of my favorites. It's a great source of information and intellectual discussion about law and business in China. Dan says that keeping it simple is what works. I've asked him to share his knowledge and experience and the insights gained from him, his firm's international law practice and to keep it simple. Aloha, Dan, how are you? Good, how are you, Mark? Okay, all right, and... Uh, I, don't, I don't feel it's appropriate to say aloha because I'm in <laughs> Seattle and I think my sweater compared to your aloha shirt really evidences the difference. Uh, it's a little colder in Seattle, I guess, huh? Yeah. I'm just assuming it is. Okay, um, now, uh, tell us a little bit about your firm first. Harris Bricken, what, what it is, how many offices you have, where and, and what it does. Give us a little background, please. Sure. Uh, we think of ourselves as a small to mid-sized firm. We have about 35 lawyers, offices in Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles, basically along the coast, and also in Beijing and Barcelona because so much of our work involves China and Spain. And what we do is help foreign companies navigate the United States, and we help American and European companies navigate Asia. Okay, and I, you know, in, you also do some work in Latin America, I understand from your website, and, and uh, cannabis law. I mean, that's Correct. a little interesting, uh, especially for us in the 60s, but uh, what, what is, that all about? What, what, what is Latin American law? What, what do you do there? Well, Latin America has become sort of a logical extension. We're actually working on opening an office in Mexico City, which we hope to do fairly soon. What's happened there is um, our Spain work is pushing us to Latin America. And in the last year and a half or so, our Asia work has been pushing us to Latin America as well, because so many of our clients that manufacture in China are looking to get out of China. And we're very mm. bullish on Mexico and Colombia and various other countries in Latin America. And so we're doing more and more in Latin America. And previously we've done quite a bit with Latin American companies going into Asia, where we've represented them. Well, that's and really I'm interesting. Sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. go go on to oh. the cannabis. But that, that Latin America is really interesting uh, to hear now what's happening in real time. That China business contacts are interested in Latin America. That that's an interesting in, insight. Yeah, but uh, well, yeah, interesting because just about. 10 minutes ago, I finished reading an article in Forbes by Ken Raposa, one of their senior contributors, who, if I were to summarize his article, it's basically China is done, over, kaput, as an international manufacturing center. And he is positing that Mexico is going to be the country that most benefits from that. And that has been our position as well. We're not saying China is completely done. It'll, it will never be completely done. But a lot of companies view the coronavirus as simply the last straw in terms of their manufacturing in China, and certainly in terms of they're doing all their manufacturing in China. Okay. Now, what about cannabis law? That I mean, I, I was a little bit okay. surprised to see that on your website. Uh, what does that mean? Yeah. 
Well, it means that I believe it was back in 2009, we had a Dutch client that essentially insisted we needed to get into the cannabis business. This was a large, relatively large Dutch cannabis company, and they were telling us that Washington State was going to be at the forefront of this. And my first thought was, well, that's ridiculous. And then we determined that wasn't so ridiculous. So we helped them and one thing led to another and we became essentially the first and biggest cannabis business law firm in the state of Washington, basically in 2010. And that practice has spread to Oregon and California as well. We have a blog, the Canna Law blog that writes about this. And now our big push is the internationalization of cannabis because Canada is big, Mexico is going legal on in April. Um, so our two neighbors are gonna be completely legal. Uh, China is a huge producer of hemp and CBD products and a lot of cannabis uh, ancillary products like vape pens, um, filters, et cetera, are made in China. And um, we're, we've done actually a lot of customs work helping clients get their products unstuck from US customs when customs has seized those products, alleging that they're illegal. Like for instance, we have a big retail cannabis client and their paper bags got seized by customs because they had pot leaves on them. And they were saying that the bags were essentially illegal. And our response was, no, bags cannot, paper bags cannot be illegal. We could use these or anyone could use these to take their lunch to work or to school in. And we ended up getting the paper bags released. And so uh, we informally call ourselves probably the only international cannabis law firm out there because even on the cannabis side, so much of our work is international and we expect that to only grow as well. And, and basically it sounds like your job as uh, cannabis lawyers, if you will, uh, is to keep, it, keep your clients out of trouble, keep them legal, whatever they're doing. That's our job with all our clients. Okay. <laughs> um, and in many respects, it's, it's, it's really no different with cannabis. Mm. Uh, even when, I mean, in, in countries like Canada, it is no different, but in, in let's say Washington State, Oregon, California, where it's legal in the state, um, we make very clear to our clients that it's still federally illegal. And we emphasize that if you're in Oregon, you have to follow Oregon law. Um, ditto if you're in Washington or in California. Okay. All I right. personally don't do all the cannabis work. Uh, okay. Well, other than I've helped uh, cannabis manufacturing companies with China. Yeah, and, uh, and, and, and China is kind of your field, right? I mean, that's your area, of, your basic area of law, right? Yes, mostly China, a little bit of some Vietnam, some Cambodia, hmm. some Thailand, a lot of uh, manufacturing uh, contracts, a lot of intellectual property contracts, intellectual property registrations, and also uh, technology licensing agreements. Yeah, it, it, it a lot of it sounds like a lot of what you do is contracts in, in a way. I mean, it, the 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 industry may be different, but what you're doing is you're negotiating or helping write the contract in China, uh, or is that correct? That's, that is a lot of what we do. I mean, we have at least a dozen lawyers who focus on China. Most of them are fluent in Chinese and English. And we help our clients with whatever help they need in China. I mean, we've done M&A deals. We have one lawyer whose focus is almost exclusively employment law in China. We draft manufacturing contracts, licensing agreements, um, distribution agreements. A lot of what we do in China for our clients is the same sort of thing that lawyers do for their clients in the United States. It's really not as exotic as it sounds. Well, on the contract side, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
we just do a lot of it in another language. Yeah, yeah. And, and so how do you manage that? I mean, your, your contracts, uh, I mean, is there a problem with that, uh, having a contract in Chinese? Or how, how do you deal with that? What do you tell your clients about contracts and doing business in China in that respect, with respect to the language? Okay. Well, it's interesting you should ask, is there a problem doing the contracts in Chinese? The answer is no. The problem usually arises when American companies put the contracts in English because that causes problems in China. American companies and even American lawyers have essentially been trained to believe that the best court to have a dispute resolved in is the one in your hometown. That is not true when dealing with China because if you have a contract with a Chinese company that says the dispute will be resolved in Honolulu or in Seattle, and then it's resolved in Honolulu or Seattle, you think you've won a lawsuit. You have won a lawsuit, sort of. You've won nine-tenths of a lawsuit. You have not won the most important remainder, and that is actually setting yourself up to be able to collect. And so you win that lawsuit in Seattle or Honolulu, then you take that judgment to China where your Chinese defendant or counterparty has all its assets, you take it to a Chinese court and they won't enforce it. So a good contract, 98 times out of 100 with a Chinese company is one that's written in Chinese, written under Chinese law, written for Chinese law for the dispute to be resolved in a Chinese court. Sometimes it makes sense for it to be resolved by arbitration, but less often than most people would believe. And the interesting thing about Chinese courts is they're way better and way fairer than most people would believe. Oh, the World okay. Bank, last time I looked, ranked China something like number 16, as in one six, in terms of enforcing contracts. And they're pretty good unless you're up against a really powerful Chinese company uh, in its hometown where it's losing, it's losing that case might cause it to have to fire people or be badly harmed, then it gets much more marginal. Or if you're in a critical uh, technology field and you're suing a Chinese company for stealing your technology, then you're gonna have a tough time. But if you're suing a Chinese company for suing your technology for making shoes and they really did steal it, you'll almost certainly win. Wow, well that, that is kind of contrary to what you hear a lot. Uh, and I guess that comes from your experience and background and what you've learned from actually doing business in China. Is that, yes. uh, yeah, that's on the ground yes. experience. And, Yes, but I don't want to denigrate those who say that, I mean, the word is China steals technology. Yeah. And there's a lot of truth to that. But China, I mean, you really have to look at the technology. And what I'm about to say is commonly believed by lawyers who deal with China a lot. And that is, some people call it the 90% rule, some call it the 95% rule. And that is, with most technologies, if your Chinese company steals it, you can sue and win. It's just things like artificial intelligence, robotics, cutting edge uh, computer chips, et cetera. Something that is really important to the Chinese government, your chances of prevailing are very low. Well, well, Dan, um, Dan, I wanna take a one minute break. And then we're going to come back and I want to ask you what you tell your clients about that when they come into your office and ask, how am I going to protect my uh, intellectual property? But we'll take a minute break. We'll be right back.
I'm Christine Linders, a physical therapy specialist and the host of Movement Matters. My show is designed to teach you the simplest and most effective treatment strategies to get you out of pain and back to doing what you love. If you or someone you know is having pain in a certain area of the body and would like a free assessment in treatment over media or in person, and then come on the show to talk about it, email us at thinktechmovementmatters at gmail.com. Or if you have a topic you would like to know more about, please email us. My goal is to decrease pain all over the world, inspiring people to take better care of their bodies, to enjoy life to the fullest. I look forward to hearing from you. Welcome back. Uh, I am talking with Ben Harris, founder of Harris Bricken Law Firm. He's in Seattle, uh, but his law firm is all over the world, basically. Uh, and, and I think he's following uh, his clients uh, and helping them wherever they're being established. Now, Dan, when we left off, we were talking about intellectual property in China. What, what do you tell your client? What, what do you tell your, your client comes into the office and says oh, he has this great idea, intellectual property, wants to protect it. What, what is the reality of that? I mean, I, I hear you saying, what, you know, interesting that you feel that there's protection available for certain intellectual property, and it's not as bad in courts as you sometimes hear. But what, what do you tell your client coming in about intellectual property protection? I tell them exactly what I just told you a minute ago. And what I also tell them is that even if I'm not 100% right on this, what are your options? Your options are to do something or to do nothing. And I know that I'm 100% right that if you do nothing, you will have no recourse if someone steals your intellectual property. And so what's really interesting about China is it doesn't have much law outside of contracts dealing with IP. So for instance, if you go to a manufacturer and say, I'd like you to manufacture these widgets, here's a drawing of my widgets. And then that manufacturer goes off and manufactures your widgets and sells them around the world and doesn't sell you a single one, you have a lousy case. So you can say that the NNN agreements that we tell you you need, these are agreements that you provide and get signed by your manufacturer before you show them anything. It prevents them from competing with you. It's a non-compete. It's a non-disclosure. It's a non-circumvent. So they can't go around you and sell to your clients, which they often have the names of because they directly ship to them. If, they, if you don't get them to sign that, I can guarantee you won't have a good recourse. And I can almost guarantee that you'll be facing big problems very shortly. So you really do need a contract. Also, you really do need to register your trademark in China, even if you're just manufacturing there, because if you don't, someone else will. And they can use your trademark, which isn't yours because it's yours maybe in the United States or Canada, but not in China. They can take that trademark and stop your product from leaving China because your product violates their trademark. And so, so I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I kind of I hear you saying we, we do as much as we can up front. Yes, which is true everywhere in the world. Um, I always say, I, I used to start a, a speech I would give on intellectual property by saying, Big companies in China want to steal your IP. Small companies in China want to steal your IP. Medium-sized companies in China want to steal your IP. Government-owned companies want to steal your IP. Privately held companies want to steal your IP. And that factory owner who you like so much, who's invited you to his or her son's or daughter's wedding, that factory owner also wants to steal your IP. But I was giving that talk at a law school and afterwards, someone came up to me and said they felt that that was too anti-China. So now I add a sentence saying, this is true everywhere in the world. <laughs> it's just that it's easier to do it in China 
and in the United States because the laws are not are different. So it's not a cultural thing. It's it's human nature. I hear you saying. I hate it when people say something's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. I, it's 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 human nature coupled with laws. If you want to call that legal culture, fine. I don't know American American culture involves uh, downloading movies off of Thor or whatever. Chinese culture involves the same thing. I think that's human nature. Okay. Well, one thing I found interesting on your website was under your name, you, you say, keep it simple. That's what works. What, what, do you, what does that mean? I mean, how, how can you keep it simple? Because people have this strange natural tendency to want to complicate things. And part of that strange, when it's in the form of, when it's our clients who do that, I think it's strange. Meaning we'll have clients who will call up and they're starting off uh, with a small business and they'll tell us, we, you know, we're calling you, we want your help. We want to form a British Islands company, a Virgin Islands company, EVI company, to own a Hong Kong company, to own a Chinese company, to manufacture widgets in China. And I'll ask them, well, 99% of our clients that are manufacturing widgets in China do so just with a US company and a contract. Why do you need companies in three different countries to manufacture widgets? And they'll give these complicated tax explanations or liability avoidance explanations and those explanations might make sense for some massive company like Apple or something like that, but they do not make sense for the overwhelming majority of companies. And companies think they're being smart by being more complicated. Lawyers and accountants like to be more complicated because it makes their clients believe they're more indispensable and it allows them to charge for more things. Keep it simple, uh, keep it less expensive, get it done. That's what I hear you saying. Exactly. And, and it, I mean, it's... Um, and, and, and that's, I'm sorry, that, that's kind of a, that, that, that's your philosophy, really, isn't it? I mean, is that, is that correct? Am I saying that right? Well, it's one of my philosophies, definitely. And it's one of the philosophies in the firm. I, I remember an American company came to us they had a 30 page memo from um, their Russian lawyer. And it was in English and it was in pretty good English. And they wanted our help. And I said to the client, do you understand this memo? <laughs> and the client said, no. And I said, I don't either. I promise you, if you hire us, our memo will be four pages or less and you will understand it and it will have a conclusion. That's keeping it simple. Okay. I don't right. know that we necessarily charged any less. I, I mean, I think it's Mark Twain, or at least it's been ascribed to Mark Twain like every other quote that's ever been. Um, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if simple is always cheaper, but it's always better. Yeah, well, Mark Twain also talked about relationships and I noticed that uh, or at least quotes ascribed to him, talk about travel and going around the world and, and meeting people and it uh, affects you. What, how about you? I mean, uh, are, are relationships important? And, uh, it, you know, how, how does it help your, your practice and your clients? Well, relationships are incredibly important. And I almost hesitate to say that because there's this idea that, relationships, the term guanxi in China means you don't need contracts, nothing else matters. That's not true. Relationships are important in China, they're important in the United States, they're important in Mexico, they're important in Spain, they're important everywhere. Um, they're important to us as a law firm. Um, we had a client who had provided fuel to a Russian vessel the vessel we learned was coming into South Korea. We, uh, the client had called their regular lawyer who said, 
there's no way we can get it arrested in a day. We called a law firm in Korea with which we've had a relationship for probably going on 20 years. We said, please help us arrest this vessel. We cannot get you the money uh, in advance because we don't have enough time. But I'll tell you, it's a good client. We know they're going to pay. And I will tell you that if they don't pay, we will pay. They said, fine, they arrested the vessel. That would never have happened if we had just called somebody off the internet. I can tell you 20 stories like that. It, it matters. I can call a lawyer in Russia, in um, Colombia and say, hey, I've got this question. Uh, do you have an answer? And oftentimes they'll say, yes, the answer is very clear. It's this. That saves tremendous amount of money as opposed to having to actually hire a law firm in Colombia. Now, if it were not so simple, we'd have to hire the law firm and pay them. But we can get quick answers from a lot of countries around the world. And a lot of these lawyers who we get quick answers from, they get answers from us too. It, it, it goes back, uh, what comes around, what goes around comes around. And we've had relationships with lawyers around the world for a long time, we trust them, they trust us. It makes for a uh, much smoother, much more effective representation of our clients and their clients. Yeah, that's. I like the mutual, mutuality of it and I like what you say about it and it makes a lot of sense. Um, now we have about a minute left. Uh, a couple questions. One, what have you learned from your China practice or, or just life in the law? And, and if somebody wants to contact you about China, how do they, how do they contact you about having, getting some help in China or I, I guess cannabis or Barcelona okay. or where, wherever? Well, I'll answer the easy question first while trying to think of a good answer to the complicated <laughs> one. The way to reach me is very easy. Go to the blog, chinalawblog.com. Go to our website, harrisbricken.com. Um, and email who you think you should email off of our website. In terms of what I've learned, um, I think I'm going to get very philosophical here. What I've learned is, and it's, it's not terribly legal, I've learned that generalizations about people uh, are, for the most part, even if somewhat accurate, are pretty worthless. You really have to judge people as individuals and um, people tend to be a lot more similar than they are different so long as they have not been, and I wish I could think of a better word, corrupted by an extreme ideology. And even China and the US, uh, people think we're so different. I think we're very, very similar. And I think a lot of our disputes arise from the fact that we're very, very similar. We're big countries that are used to being able to get along well without having to um, worry too much about the countries around us. Well, Dan, uh, I want to thank you for uh, sharing your knowledge. I really like that last part uh, about people and how we're pretty much in a way all the same with those certain exceptions and with the caution that, that you put in there. And uh, I really appreciate you keeping it simple for us. And uh, we, we look forward to talking to you again. So as we say in Hawaii, alo uh, aloha. See you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs>